how the legal services industry can find or develop the skills required to support rapid digital transformation. We only have one hour during which each of our panel members is going to give a short presentation. Then we'll do some, some cross panel discussion and throw in some Q and A um, as and when appropriate. So to the panel, we are really, really honored to have such distinguished guests join us today, each of whom represents a unique and differentiated perspective from a different part of the legal, legal ecosystem. We start off with Mark A. Cohen, who amongst many other things is the executive chairman of the Digital Legal Exchange. And he's also a regular contributor to Forbes magazine on the legal ecosystem. We're joined by two colleagues from Major, Lindsay and Africa who have a wealth of insight into the legal and digital talent market. Duke Trang, Managing Director of Transform Advisory Services and his colleague, Deb ben Kanan, who's partner and senior practice leader for in-house council recruiting. Welcome to both of you. And finally, in order, but definitely not in stature, we have Bill Deckelman, who is the GC of DXC Technology, who's guided his own legal function through a landmark digital transformation and can give us the unadulterated view from the front line. So thanks to all our panelists for joining us. So I'm gonna hand straight over to Mark now, who's gonna kick us off with an overview of how legal delivery is changing and the implications of this for skills and talent. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Isabel, and welcome everybody. William Gibson, uh, an American futurist writer, famously said, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. He may not have been referring to the legal industry and its clients, but he might well have been. Uh, because make no mistake about it, um, business is in one place uh, and the legal industry is in quite a different place. Um, part of that divide is uh, attributable to digital transformation. And digital transformation itself is a term that is really widely misunderstood, particularly within the legal industry. Um, you asked about 100 lawyers, um, what is digital transformation? And you probably get about 110 different answers. Um, but most people think that it is really just tech-centered, period that it refers to maybe a platform, maybe the latest app, um, some, some of the many, many, many uh, scores of so-called disruptive kind of technologies um, that uh, legal pundits uh, tend to predict uh, are going to just change everything. But the reality of it is, is that although tech certainly is changing the world, it is also changing human behavior because it's human behavior that is really changing the world. And it is human behavior that is utilizing, or in the case of the legal industry, uh, underutilizing technology in such a way that they are liberated to be able to create different dynamics with their customers um, such that um, they can do more for customers they can create much more of a symbiotic relationship with customers as opposed to a transactional one. Um, they can utilize data in a way that is going to predict customer behavior, um, be able to determine what is sticking and what is not sticking and a whole host of other things. Now, business has been well along the digital journey and it is a journey. It's not turning on a light switch, it is a process. And an integral part of that process is the change in human mindset and the change in human behavior, which among other things, embraces new ways of doing things, challenges existing models, all with the desire not to create change for change's sake, but to change in such a way that is designed to better uh, enhance the end-to-end -end experience of customers. And some of you in this audience who are lawyers might say, well, why does he keep using the word customers? Because laws customers are customers. Clients are a special category of customer. There is of course the attorney client privilege, which is a very, very special relationship. Just as in medicine, there is the patient physician relationship. However, Make no mistake about it, 
the legal industry is a service industry. Even though lawyers perhaps think that it is their birthright to dictate the terms and conditions of their relationships with customers. But it is business laws customers who are really reimagining the legal function. What is the purpose of lawyers? When are they needed? Um, why are lawyers needed for a particular tasks? Or indeed, are they needed? Um, these are some of the things that are reshaping the legal industry. Um, and the legal industry has lagged its customers, but make no mistake about it. Its customers are now not only um, suggesting, but increasingly insisting that the legal industry align itself more closely with its customers, do a better job of satisfying its customer needs and expectations and demands, and indeed doing a better job of uh, making their services and products available to a wider segment of society. These are some of the things that are going on today, not only within the legal industry, but in the larger society, which in turn is shaping and reshaping the legal industry. All of these changes uh, are really changes, as I said before, in human behavior, in human mindsets, in the skills that are going to be required for new jobs, which are going to replace older jobs. Um, Gardner predicts that by 2025, in contracting, 50% of all jobs presently done by lawyers are going to be automated. Now that, at first blush, would spell doom and gloom for a lot of corporate attorneys. Um, and perhaps for those that don't read the memo and don't get with the changes, it will be a gloomy time. But for those who learn new skill sets, for those who adapt to this changing environment, for those who see in the challenges brought on by digital transformation, the opportunities that it also creates for the legal function, whether it's licensed attorneys or alive legal professionals, to elevate their importance within the, um, their customers, um, the companies that they serve, as well as the society. This is a great, great time for people uh, in the legal industry who are ready, willing, and able to be more collaborative, to work cross-functionally, to work agilely, and to really begin to say, you know, let me rethink from the customer perspective, not from the lawyer perspective, what can I do to improve the lives and the businesses of my customers? So this is sort of my very quick sketch of uh, what's going to follow from our next speakers. So I turn it over. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark, um, for, for that introduction. Uh, if you would permit me, I'll, I'd like to spend the next five, six minutes to peel the onion a little bit further um, based on what Mark um, has described, and then we can go into what actually happens in real life with, with Deb and, and Bill. Um, I do wanna get back to a couple of comments that, that Mark made. Um, and part of it is, is going back to the notion of understanding the customer and, and, and being uh, client-centric. And I know on the audience today, we have many in-house counsel, but we do have also law firm representatives. I will speak primarily from the in-house counsel perspective, but the same comments can be adapted to um, uh, uh, law firms uh, as well. Um, and part of the unpacking uh, is really understanding the notion of digital transformation uh, and then how does that impact lawyers and talent in particular. And so with the, with I, with the hope of being client-centric, I wanna look from the perspective of a board of directors or a CEO. Um, what does it digital transformation mean for them? So as a straw man, let me put this forward and then we can go on from there. For most CEOs and board, what digital transformation means to them is the adoption of digital technology into selected areas of a business that finally changes the business operations to create value for the customer. Let me reiterate, the adoption of digital technology into selected areas of the business, fundamentally changing how the business operates to create additional value for the customer. Um, and let me spend a little bit 
uh, time on the business side, again, with the hope of being customer centric, where the CEO is sitting, there are three areas in which um, you know, the digital journey um, may take for the enterprise. Um, and the, the three areas are in relation to where the customer sits um, and what the business does. So for example, where they may elect to undergo digital transformation is how they interact with a customer, whether it's marketing or delivering services. I still remember the time of Netflix when I received the, the, the DVDs in the mail, watched the movie, and then returned the, the DVD back in the mail again. Netflix went through digital transformation in terms of how um, the product is actually delivered to the customer, how it markets to the customer is no longer through the mail, but through algorithms that they, they see on their screen. The second area where, where the digital journey happens, a transformation journey happens for enterprises, the offerings themselves. What exactly do they sell? Is it an associate to what their core uh, products or is it even a new offering that it was not digital before, but it's based on the cloud or other types of digital offerings that didn't exist before. The third area is what I call operational infrastructure. Whether the enterprise wants to be more efficient to increase profitability or increase speed to market, whatever the case may be, these are digital transformations that happen away from the customer in the back end, if you will. And the reason I mentioned those three areas is that depending on the digital transformation the enterprise goes through, the, the, the demands on the, um, will drive the demands on the law department. So when we say digital transformation, if I were a board of directors or a CEO look, talking to the general counsel, I wanna understand, does your law department know understand, understanding the digital transformation that enterprise, that enterprise will go through and how will you change your legal service model to cater to what the enterprise needs. The legal support um, for digital transformation on the front end of the customer is very different than the legal support required if the offering uh, were undergoing a digital transformation. So the notion of, of, of customer centricity is key in terms of digital transformation, but also what are the implications for talent? Um, when, I, when we look at talent, of an enterprise or digital transformation, we look at two levels, the leadership team of the in-house department or a law firm, and then the broader team, because the demands are quite different. In terms of leadership team, we look to whether the general counsel and the, the leadership team of that group can truly engage with business to understand the digital transformation that's happening at the enterprise level. And also, do they have the skills and knowledge to think about, do they need to, revise their business model, uh, the, the coverage model, or do, does the law department need to undergo their own digital transformation? And that's a very different analysis, almost separate from what the digital journey of the enterprise may be. So that's the, so the, the, the talent needs at that leadership level is much more complex. The skills and mindsets are much more complex than what's required at the broader team level. And the broader team level, most of whom are still concerned about doing their day-to-day -day work, practicing law. The digital transformation that the law department will go through will definitely require some additional new skills and mindsets, but the focus there is not um, getting strategic business leaders setting the strategy of digital transformation, but how do you enhance performance on a, an aggregate group level of the broader team? Now, given the different demands on talent, how do organizations do whether it's law firms or in-house. Um, the, the most recent survey from Deloitte um, suggests that, well, demonstrated 50% of senior executives uh, believe that current HR um, processes and tools are not effective um, in terms of driving engagement performance. We can quibble with the number, but at least 50% believe that traditional HR um, uh, processes are not effective, in part because most traditional HR uh, practices are designed for traditional environments, which um, we don't have today. And it's a one size fits all approach, which often doesn't work. Um, and so what happens is that a lot of the HR programs are, um, are not fit for purpose for the legal department or it's too complicated. And actually uh, people 
functions don't use them. The second problem of current um, organization is that talent is seen as an afterthought. There are a lot of operational strategic meetings and there's a separate meeting on talent. Um, that is a mistake we believe because those are integrated issues. You can't discuss the adoption of strategy unless you are confident you have the talent to drive the strategy. It cannot be a separate conversation. So uh, I'll leave with this. What are the, the three things I, I think organizations need to, to do to move forward? One is really talent needs to be prioritized um, as a general deployment of capital. Just as GCs think about deploying financial capital, they have to think about deploying human capital at the same time. It cannot be disaggregated from strategy or organizational operations. Second, um, GCs need to be much more rigorous in terms of talent development. Um, we don't use data enough. Uh, and studies suggest that top organizations employ data analysis and analytics five times more than poorly performing organizations. Um, there's a lot to be done in terms of collecting data and using data uh, around talent. Um, but data is in, in and of itself is not the end, end goal. You have to have a perspective to look to, uh, to help you figure out what is the right data to collect and use. And so when we work with GCs, we often think about what is the talent development framework that you should adopt in order to drive the data collection analysis in order to get the right results. Um, and finally, uh, you we will still need external talent. So the final thing we, we often talk to GCs about is Besides the internal development, you need to look to have an uh, almost like external M&A strategy for talent acquisition. Don't be reactive. Don't wait until someone leaves and then suddenly I need to go find someone to replace that person. But really make sure that you have the peripheral vision on the talent marketplace um, uh, and understand when you can add talent in order to create additional value without waiting for that next resignation. So I think um, one, the talent capital um, conversation has to be prioritized. And two, there needs to be more rigor you know, with the internal development program. And finally, there needs to be, um, GC should consider an, 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 almost an M&A strategy for talent uh, by looking at um, the, uh, again, a more developed view of the, the talent marketplace external to the organization. Thank you very much, Duke. And I'm sorry, I got cut off after Mark spoke, so they all went a bit, a bit quiet. Thank you very much for those insights. Really, really fascinating. We've heard from you that it's a strategic issue, digital transformation. It's got this kind of trickle down effect from board level to leadership team level, right down to broader team level. And I, and I want to go to Deb now, um, who's got a really impressive track record in the talent business over a number of years. And I'm hoping that Deb, you're gonna be able to take us right from the sort of theory of all of this down to practice. What's really happening on the ground right now? And does this resonate with you? This absolutely resonates with me. Um, so everybody's heard a little bit or a lot about change today and adapting. Um, I'm gonna discuss some changes in the legal market from a recruitment view. Um, I'm gonna to touch upon three subjects. Uh, and I know we're all going quickly today. So I would encourage anybody who's listening, if they have follow-up to link in with me or I'm gonna volunteer all of the other uh, panelists as well um, for anything follow-up that we can help with. But I'm gonna discuss the state of the 2021 market, legal market. I'm gonna talk about what changes I've seen over the years. Um, and then finally, what a CEO is looking for in his or her general counsel. So to Duke's point, all of the other roles right now, besides the general counsel role, the market's insane. People are being reactive. They're not being proactive. There's a lot of hiring happening. Um, and it's a challenge right now. It's a huge challenge to bring talent in because Law firm associates are happy. Um, I think law firms are finally getting it and are being flexible and are paying a lot. And um, it, you know, they're also busy. So they're not responding to phone calls or emails anymore. Um, we have seen a real um, log jam almost in, in the areas of corporate governance, securities, M&A, commercial contracts, privacy, government contracts. Um, at the below the general counsel level. It is, it is very tough and, and there is a lot of hiring happening and the good candidates are going fast. For the general counsel roles, we are still in a place where people are interested, um, but they are being highly selective. Um, we see you know, companies relaxing and getting back to normal and 
people are changing out general counsel and the top levels are, are transforming. Um, so that's the market this year in a nutshell. Let's talk a little bit about what's changed over the years. Um, I've been doing this for 20, 20 years and I have seen a lot of changes as of late. Um, first, diversity. Um, in the wake of the last year and a half, diversity has always been a priority for clients, but it is a, it, it's a non-starter now to not have a diverse slate of candidates. And that's at all levels, in-house, general counsel, board of directors. Um, diverse slates are a must-have and diversifying a legal team is a must-have. I think the pandemic obviously did a ton to change the in-the-office requirement. We're seeing a push from candidates to work remotely now. I mean, at least some of the part of the time, if not all of the time. And that's a very individualized thing. Some clients are really open to that, others are not. Um, we are seeing hiring and onboarding done virtually, um, all through technology. Uh, the other big change that I've seen is there's a whole new generation of lawyers, and I'm allowed to call, I'm allowed to say millennials, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, gone are the days of my generation where we just took a job and put our heads down and we worked. I think this new generation of lawyers is, is very focused on kind of the right things. They're focused on flexibility. They're focused on happiness. They're less willing to compromise. They're more willing to switch jobs if the job isn't satisfying. So I think there's been a lot of change in the perspective of what working means. Um, and the last big change that I've seen in the last couple of years has been there's a big focus on legal operations. Uh, a lot of general counsel are hiring lawyers and non-lawyers who have a strong knowledge of technology, of finance, of management, of DE&I um, to come in and sort of, you know, be the go be to be the in between. Um, those people will sometimes be the lead or a strong partner in a digital transformation. They'll be evaluating vendors. They'll be making, you know, projections. Um, so the legal ops piece has become very important. And the final piece that I'm going to talk about is what CEOs are looking for in a general counsel. It, it used to be, you know, corporate securities experience and, you know, some industry experience. And, you know, now it's broader, right? Great lawyer, industry or translatable industry experience, gravitas, poise. That's a, those are table stakes. Those are a given. Uh, but now more than ever, CEOs want a strategic general counsel. What does that mean, right? Business-minded, somebody with strong, real global experience, risk management experience, a high level of emotional intelligence, um, nimble, flexible. I mean, this is the theme of today, right? You want to understand your customer. You want to be a proactive partner. Um, business partnership, business savvy, you know, you, they want somebody at the table who can come at things from other than just what the law says. And I think that kind of, you know, I'll, I'll conclude by saying, I think that kind of brings us back of the need to keep abreast of the changes in legal, including digital transformation. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Bill and Isabel, you'll, you'll do the introduction, but, um, now we can hear a real life example from a general counsel who is business minded. Fabulous. Thank you, Deb. That was really, really fascinating. And I particularly like the focus on business partnering, which is a great segue into Bill, um, who, as you know, had, is one of those rare GCs who's actually done it. He's been through a digital transformation. He's led his team. It's been successful. Um, who better to take us through that journey and the skills build that your team's had to build or you've had to build with your team or acquire to really push that transformation through and make it successful. It would be great to hear, hear that story from you. Okay, thanks, Isabel. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I'll just say here at the beginning that uh, all of the comments so far definitely resonate with me. Um, and I, I'd like to give just a, I'll say the quick version of our uh, transformation story um, here, uh, just to give the context uh, for the real subject, which is people and talent. Uh, I'll just uh, preview here at the beginning, I, I believe, as Mark said, it's, it's really about you know a people-centric um, process, um, and you know we've we've been on our transformation journey. This is our fifth year, 
uh, the planning for it began in 2016. And I'll just say probably in 2016, I had certainly had a, a good idea that people were gonna be really important, but I don't know that I would have said it the way I just did. If, if, if you do not have your culture and your the mindset of the vast majority, you'll never have 100% probably, but the vast majority of your organization uh, thinking, as we say, with a digital mindset, uh, your transformation will not be successful. That's just as straightforward as I can be. But just to give you context quickly, um, we uh, our journey was born out of a merger, uh, which is, is probably pretty common uh, in 2017, where we were putting together two very large, I'll say legacy IT services companies and we were given the dictate at the beginning. And when you do, uh, it'll be a 30% cost takeout year one. Um, well, that gave me reason to pause a bit about how in the heck are we supposed to support the business um, that's being supported today uh, with fewer resources, uh, particularly that large of a cut. And so we began to give thought to this. We had 11 months uh, before the actual merger to do the planning. And we spent the uh, first few months the traditional way, trying to think through, you know, how do we, you know, cut these resources and offshore this and do that. And, you know, all these kinds of things you traditionally do. And it really just did not get us where we needed to be. And so we began to look at it from the standpoint of, you know what, the business at this point in 2016 had been transforming digitally for years. Digital transformation is not new. It's been around for years on the business side. Legal, not so much. But we looked at that and said, you know what? The expectation from the C-suite is that we have not only year one cost takeout, but year over year cost improvement. Now, how do you do that? you know, without improving quality of the services you're providing. The only way to do it is to transform the way you do the work and to have technology driving and enabling that to happen. So that's why we started out on the journey. Um, and we focused on our contracting organization, organization, which is where our cost scale and our global scale really is. The difference is that for a company like ourselves, IT services, it's actually strategic. It's not one of these side functions that you don't mind outsourcing. This is strategic to our company, our relationships with our customers. Uh, but that's what we did. And we started with the vision of how do we impact the value to the business? In the long run, it doesn't happen overnight. In fact, I would say looking back at last year, our fourth year was the year that we really started to see tangible results starting to come through. Those first few years are really focused on, you know, um, building the, automating your practices, getting very efficient internally. So it's a little bit inward looking to the organization, but where you're headed is kind of what I call level two maturity, which is when you really deliver impact to the business is about data and getting your arms around data analyzing that data, starting to address real business issues like revenue, faster, uh, quality, better, uh, risk, mitigate it, identify it, mitigate it. All these things, that's what data will do. And that's what the business expects. So that's where we're headed. Now, in terms of talent, why? what is it that we're looking for that's so special? Uh, Deb mentioned table stakes, and I agree with that 100%. We are very focused on, we want the you know best lawyers, best contracting professionals, whatever it may be. We want integrity. We want you know people that have read the trusted advisor of what two decades ago. You know, we want people who understand what it means to collaborate with a client. Table stakes. What we're really looking for, because digital transformation is hard, it involves innovation, it's long term. So you need energy. Um, it's, it's being comfortable with change. So there's a lot happening with digital transformation. So what we're looking for is, you know, very clearly, and Deb mentioned some of these, but, you know, people who are curious, they're creative, 
They're agile thinkers. They're willing to think out of the box. They're willing to try something, even if it means they fail. Something lawyers just have a hard time coming to grips with, but we fail because we try fast and we move on. Um, just digitally aware, they, they understand at least generally what technology can do uh, in these things, and they understand digital and the reason for it. Uh, you know, very serious about continuous learning, but probably above all else, they're passionate and they're highly energized. Uh, those are the kinds of attributes we're looking for. And probably a little different than what you would have said 10 years ago, you know, about lawyers and other professionals related to law. Uh, but that's very much where we are. And again, just from a real experience, had we not been able to get a good group thinking like that, we wouldn't have been successful. So Isabel, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much, Bill. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting. A great end to the presentation. And thank you all the panelists. Now, there's so many areas I'd like to pull out here, but just because you just mentioned the words uh, there, Bill, technology and innovation, these are two buzzwords that we hear a lot uh, in the context of digital transformation. And we know that law departments and law firms are increasing their spend on technology. That's a fact. Now, Gartner, who I'm quoting again, recently recommended, and I'm going to quote this verbatim, that legal departments hire staff with proven data analytics and legal technology skills by identifying a new talent pipeline from alternative legal service providers and legal technology companies. I'm interested in your take on that statement for the panel generally. Are the ALSPs and the legal tech providers the right place to be looking for these new technology and data skills? And if not there, where? And I think I'm going to throw that one to Mark to start off with. Well, I don't think there's one, uh, a single one size fits all answer to that question, Isabel. Um, I think it would come from multiple sources. I think, you know, like anything else, you have to take a strategic approach and for each of the pieces in the mosaic, dare I say, um, you may need slightly different qualities. Uh, I think Bill has, you know, sort of stitched together the common threads of them and Deb has as, has as well. So uh, I, I do think, however, that, um, you know, there is uh, increasingly going to be um, a, an alignment and an integration and hopefully, you know, a seamless integration between uh, those who are engaged in the practice of law and those who are involved in the business of delivering legal services because I, I think uh, Bill as a, as a, a GC and Duke as a former GC would agree with me here that you know, for lawyers, um, these may be important distinctions. But I, I think that we are definitely at a time where from the client perspective, the customer perspective, historical distinctions between no, so-called lawyers and non-lawyers cease to be really important except for the very limited notion that you don't want someone um, you know, going in and trying a major case who has not had a, a, a legal training. But apart from that, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, you look and you see that more and more people in legal departments uh, are not people with, who are licensed to practice. Um, and I think that's uh, the future, but I, I defer to my colleagues. Okay, Deb, can I, can I bring you in at this point? Because you referenced um, in your presentation legal operations, which is obviously a massive growing area. And I think those sort of innovation skills, technology skills, we often associate those with the legal operations professional. Exactly. Where are those professionals coming from? Tell us a bit about that. I mean, I'm, I'm doing one of those searches right now for a Fortune 500 public company, um, and they will consider non-JDs as well as JDs. Quite honestly, we're finding them at other we're finding them at other big companies. We're finding them in law firms. Some of them are lawyers. Some of them are not. Um, the transformative nature of what a legal ops person comes in to do can be really significant. Um, and and the skill sets I mean they could come from a finance background. Um, they could come from a technology background, but typically they're going to have skills in in all of those areas. Um, and they're not, you're right, Mark, they're not practicing law. Their, their job is to, their job is to, to bring the legal department 
into the next place and the better place and to continually look at what's being spent and how it's being spent and who the vendors are and if they're getting the best technology and if it's, you know, they're constantly keeping up, I think, with the evolution in a, in a legal department. Yeah, and given that there is this, this sort of meld between those different kinds of skill sets and the, the law and non-law distinction is beginning to disappear, thankfully, when you're thinking, Duke, about talent strategy, how, if you were advising um, a corporate legal team on their talent strategy, how would you advise them to interface better with the business, to understand the demands of the business and to shape their strategy accordingly? Yeah, if I could um, answer that question in a way uh, and connect it back to that Gartner uh, quote and also Mark's um, thought on this. I, I, I think the Gartner comment is a bit overstated. Uh, legal operations um, is an increasingly important part of a law department and law firm's uh, business, if you will. But it is part of the business. The other, and I'd be very interested to hear from Bill. The other part of the business, and believe it or not, a lot of our colleagues in the law are still practicing law. And even at DXC, where it's gone through a, a significant digital transformation, the value that the clients that I believe at DXC sees is whether that lawyer sitting in the negotiation room at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> there are five difficult issues left in the contract, some of which are legal, some of which are non-legal. Does that lawyer have the commercial acumen and legal skills to put, pull that deal over the line? The technology and operations bit will perhaps enable some of that, maybe increase the capacity or, or time for that lawyer to develop those advisories, the kind of business-based advisory skills. Um, uh, so technology is an enabler. So I think from a, a strategy point of view, um, my suggestion is that we be very surgical about talent development. There are parts of the law department's business like where we need to increase the capacity and skills on the operations side, which includes data analytics or technology, but there's still a significant function in a law department that still practices law. And we don't do very well in training that piece either. And I think um, there needs to be a refocus on, uh, on that piece as well as the operations piece. Interesting. And, I, and, and, and sorry, Deb, just to throw that to build very quickly um, in response, I mean, if you, would you take Duke's advice? Or would you be similarly surgical about your talent development as he suggests? I always take Duke's advice, <laughs> uh, but but yes, I I think it's true. What he says is that you know we don't always put enough focus on that training, and there's no doubt about it. That's why I said table stakes. It's easy to kind of blow right past that, but no, that's a very critical part of what we do is that talent that understands how to negotiate a big complex uh, IT deal. No doubt about it. But but. That's what's so challenging and fun about these things for general counsels. There's so many aspects to all this that you have to put together and make them all move down the path and go in the right direction. And I'll just say there just it's at least for me, it's easy to keep in mind there are efficiencies and there are there's indirect value that comes out of efficiencies uh, from automation and things like that. And by the way, data comes out of that as well. And there's direct value. And if you talk to your CEO and the C-suite and the clients, they, the, the, the efficiencies are like, really? Yeah, we kind of expected that from you 10 years ago. Uh, what we're really interested in is what you're doing to help us Duke at 2 a.m. in the morning as you're negotiating. Do you, are you able to look on your laptop and bring up a risk profile and a portfolio to show me on this issue you know, over the last three years, we've done this with these clients and this and that, and show me the data. That's value, and that is addressing risk, you know, and so there are things like that where the data comes through to inform and empower the lawyers who are sitting at the table at 2 a.m. in the morning. So there are a lot of different uh, tangents on this that all kind of come together, you know, and move, move down the path. Deb, did you want to did you have some data to that? Yeah, I was just going to add to what Duke was saying that there is a lot of market reactivity, um, you know, and especially given the pandemic and what has happened over the last year, I think that that 
the strategic piece of how you develop your legal talent, how you develop your legal strategy for some general counsels is, is sort of taking a back, uh, a back seat to, oh my gosh, we don't have enough people right now. Like we need to hire. And so um, I do think the market can really impact the strategic thought process of a legal department. And that's just something you have to you have to keep in mind as, you know, as Duke says, you want to be strategic, you know, and Bill is talking about the way he's been strategic. It's, it's, it's important to not let the, the circumstances surrounding you dictate how you grow and develop your team. Yeah, that's, that's a great build. Thank you. Just to shift gears a little bit. Now, Mark kicked off this session by saying quite rightly, digital transformation is not about technology. And I think we all accept that. And then Bill used the word curiosity when talking about the mindset you need to develop. So I want to think a little bit beyond technical legal skills, which we touched on, and beyond innovation and data, which we sort of touched on, and think a bit about the human skills that allow lawyers to become more customer centric, which of course is a very important part of digital transformation. And at the, at the exchange, we've seen a real growing interest amongst corporate legal teams in particular in legal design as a way of driving a more customer centric mindset. I mean, Coca-Cola and HSBC are sort of leading the path on this. Now, Deb, I wanted to ask you from your perspective, is legal design something you see on the wish list or is this kind of a nebulous and faddy thing that just, you know, we, we pretend is important, but it, it isn't necessarily from your perspective? No, I mean, I, I wish it were. And, and I think that that's what Duke and I are trying to do is to, to get it on the wish list a little bit more. I mean, we will see a request for someone who's transformed a legal department, but it's very rare the digital piece becomes part of the criteria, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah. And Duke, maybe you have other thoughts on that, but I, I don't see it in general counsel searches. Yes, I, I think it, it's subsumed into very broad concepts, particularly in the JDs, the job descriptions that we see there, like, you know, strong commercial acumen, strategic right. thinking, problem assessment, problem solving. And I think the digital transformation is seen as a component of those competencies. Mm -hmm. And so while digital transformation isn't specifically enumerated, it's, it's part of that. So to, to your question, Isabel, how do you identify, but also train for what I call higher cognitive skills? You, know, you mentioned curiosity, problem solving, well, I mentioned problem solving, creativity sometimes jump into it. Um, and, and it's really, you know, um, a lot of research shows that it's, what's interesting is that people who are hyper specialists, like the ones we promote, you know, head of commercial, head of litigation into leadership teams, they actually are disadvantaged when it comes to the complex problem solving bit the kind of strategic business skills that we look for in, in, in senior leaders, hyper-specialists actually are quite disadvantaged. So a lot of my work is, is really thinking about, there's a lot of research behind this, is how do you um, scale the, the toolkit for them to develop that the curiosity? What does curiosity look like, creativity look like? You just don't wake up one day and say, I'm gonna be creative today or curious today. There are a lot of toolkits that you can develop as a young lawyer to what, what we call scaffold. There has to be a framework where through, you know, with a framework, then you start to scaffold experience and other tools on top to create what clients perceive as creative or strategic. And that starts much earlier than what we do today in the profession. Interesting. And, and Mark, from your perspective, we've been on, on a couple of legal design um, uh, seminars together, and I know that's something you're interested in. What's your take on how legal design or, or a framework or approach to problem solving can help to, to, to encourage that curiosity and the customer centricity that's so important and has run as a theme throughout this whole, this whole webinar? Well, uh, first of all, I, 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 this, this may be a, a somewhat um, provocative response, but I, to me, people are born curious, um, you know, and certain people just have a pension for asking questions um, for um, what other people may say is a frolic and a detour. You know, instead of just doing the homework that's assigned, they read something that is seemingly disjointed, but then you find that this is the kid, you know, who sets the curve on the exam by being able to relate it to different topics. 
Um, and I think we're living in a time today, um, Bill, Bill just uh, sent me a fabulous short article on just this topic that, um, you know, the, the, day, the days uh, of the, you know, sort of hyper um, uh, specific person, you know, the, the person who has sort of intellectual blinders um, are, are kind of over. Uh, and what, you know, I think in this world, which is so fast changing, where industries, the barriers separating, you know, industries are, are becoming increasingly blurred. Um, and and this is, these are laws customers, for God's sake. So this is not an abstract thing. Um, how are you possibly going to discharge your ethical responsibility as a lawyer to zealously and competently represent an organization that is functioning so dynamically if you are, you know, just in this, you know, kind of hyper siloed kind of a mindset answer, you can't. Um, and so I, I think that the process really starts much earlier on. And I, I'd be very curious to hear what Def has to say about this. But, you know, to me, as someone who in past lives hired a lot of people, um, I would always look for not necessarily the person who had the best grades, but someone who had um, demonstrated excellence in a different field, which suggested to me that she or he was disciplined, had passion, would really, you know, excel, and particularly if it was a team endeavor. Um, where it wasn't just about them, but it was about their, you know, having to collaborate with others. So Deb, what, what, if you don't mind my asking uh, 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 Isabel, uh, asking Deb directly, uh, is that square at all with your thinking? I hear you, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. That's okay, it wouldn't let me unmute. Um, so I wanna come at this from two perspectives, one from the hiring manager's perspective and one from my perspective. Um, the hiring manager typically tells us what they're looking for and it can be significant experience, you know, life experience, business experience, or it can be top 10 law schools. Um, and it is very individual depending on the person who's doing the hiring. Um, I've seen kind of the spectrum. For me, when I assess a candidate, I'll tell you, I love athletes, people that did some sort of athletic something or another, because it shows me they had determination, they had dedication, they achieved. I love people that went to law school at night while working full time, because that shows me what kind of person they are. Um, you know, those are the little pieces that I will look at to see how focused, how motivated, how determined they are to be successful. Um, but again, you know, the client sort of dictates where we go with what we want, but I will push when hmm. I think someone has an amazing story, their story is really important to me. I will push back and say, I think you should talk to this person for this reason. Mark, if I could... Uh... Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry. If I could add to, to what you and Deb is, is saying, there, there's actually a, a learning theory behind what all of, both of you are saying. And in a sense, I, 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 I disagree with you, Mark, that some of cur like curiosity and problem solving, some of it is, is, is natural skills, I get it, but a lot of it is, uh, can, can be learned. But number two, this is the, 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 from a learning point of view, an argument for diversity. Because what learning method uh, research shows that if you have different experience or backgrounds, you're more able to engage in what's called deep structure analogical reasoning. In, in, in law school, we learn torts and, and, and contracts and we distinguish hundred cases of contract, you know, what's an, an offer. That's, that's a very superficial analogical reasoning. But, the, but the, the business leaders that we see, the successful ones are able to engage in what's called deep structure and logic. They are able to see the, the common structure in very different areas of the world or businesses. And because they have that broad view, they're better able to come to better decisions because they can say, oh, it's similar to that particular problem I've seen, which is not in law, but it's in this area, but this is how it's similar. And this is how I'm matching their strategy. So a lot, you can teach some of those tools. Um, uh, and what I find is that once we give lawyers some of those tools, they actually 
are very focused on developing them. And that's when um, what they do is perceived as creative or problem solving. So there is, a, there is hope Mark beyond natural abilities. Thank you, Duke. I'm just gonna take a, a, a question from our unseen audience here um, at this stage. And maybe I'll put this, put this to, to Bill. So the question is, what's your take on T-shaped educational development? Would you see this as a starting point to introduce a talent program? And I think T-shaped means, someone will correct me, you're sort of a generalist along the horizontal and you have a deep uh, vertical expertise. I think that's right, jump in if I've got that wrong. Bill, do you have a view on, on that T-shaped model and how that might work for, for, a, for a team like yours? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think that's a bad model. I mean, there are several models out there and they, they in some ways get at the same issue uh, slightly differently, but it, it's back to what I was saying earlier, which is, you know, you, you know, look, if you're talking about lawyers in particular in-house, you know, the early years of your career and as you build up, you know, you definitely need to be focused on building your credibility in a certain area. You need to be known as, you know, if you want to be like one of the best, you want to be an excellent lawyer in a certain field. And so that's, that's great. So you build that up. But along the way, you know, you've got those people skills that you're develop, hopefully developing uh, with your client. And then for what we're talking about, which again, I'm trying to make a distinction that if you're talking about true, thorough digital transformation, you're looking for a slightly different mindset. It, it's not just, can you get along and collaborate with clients? You better be able to do that no matter who you are, if you're in-house. What we're talking about is people who want to innovate every day and who do understand design thinking and they do want to be part of a cohort that's working on identifying and solving a problem. They like that, it energizes them. And so that's why you do design thinking. And uh, you know, that's, if that's not part of your culture as you're doing a serious transformation program, you know, it's gonna be a real challenge. That, that's really, that's, that's, that's a great insight. Can, I, we're nearly at time, but I, I want to just ask each of our panel members to give me a super quick response to this one question. Okay, so super quick got five minutes left to wrap up. So there will be GCs listening to this. I know there are currently. If you could give one piece of advice to the GCs listening to this webinar who are thinking, where do I start without skilling my team? I'm about to undergo digital transformation. What do I do? One piece, what would it be? Deb. Unmute Deb and she will tell us. <coughs> okay, Duke, as you're unmuted, you go for it. Go ahead, go ahead Duke, you start. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... I think I'm going to take a very 30,000 foot view. I, I think um, the context we talked about this is the world is getting more complex and it's going to get even more complex. Um, so the challenge for any organization, including law, is how do you um, equip your team to be better learners yeah. more quickly? And that would include whether it's digital transformation or business, whatever the case may be. It's about empowering with the right skills to um, make them better and quicker learners. Perfect. Deb. Yes. So I'm going to say, and this doesn't mean, I don't mean this to be self-serving, but talk it through with professionals. You know, if, if you have a complex accounting portfolio, you would talk to an accountant before you made any changes. Talk to somebody who knows what they're doing so that they can help you think this through uh, with any pitfalls that you may not see. Sage advice indeed. Bill. Uh, I would say start with the uh, vision, the long-term vision in mind. What, sit down with the CEO, the CFO, the COO, CIO, and talk about, you know, what are their needs? Where do they see the risk? Uh, how do they see data uh, in an ideal world? How do they see uh, uh, data being able to solve some of those issues? And that's what you're going for. And you start with that vision. Perfect. And finally, Mark. Can you cross-functionally uh, and understand uh, the objectives of the end user. Wonderful. Thank you, all our panelists. I think this has been a really engaging and lively discussion. We can't see you out there in the ether. I really hope you've enjoyed it too. I want to say a big thank you for giving us your time, your expertise, panelists. It's been really, really a wonderful discussion. And on behalf of MLA and the Digital Legal Exchange, to all those watching, Thank you very much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. Please give us your feedback. We'd love to hear what we did well, what we could do better. We want to hear from you. And I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much and have a really wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.